faces I recognize and all those guys. It's Christmas time. It's fun to see this happening here. And I don't see a lot of other decorations yet. When, it, when do those come up? Pretty soon? Right? <laughs> so now, like in your home, though, have you... Um, Home has all been decorated. We have a tree up now. Uh, that hasn't been decorated. That's later today. So it's all it's coming about here. Uh, yesterday, we went up to Oakland, where we have our son and daughter-in-law and granddaughter. You know we have a granddaughter, right? Yeah. <laughs> She's the cutest thing ever. Um, 15 months now. So this was the reason we were up there was to see them get their Christmas tree and to see Elliot, our granddaughter, see her Christmas tree for the first time. You know, when, when she's three months, that, ah, that doesn't do anything. But now this was the first time for her to actually participate in it and see this thing in their living room with all the lights on it and put things on it and all this kind of stuff. It's great fun. It's that time of year where for most of us, perhaps all of us, we, we go find these boxes that we have hidden away for a long time that carry all these treasures in us, you know, the treasures that we've kind of picked up over the years that, that uh, carry value because they remind us of things that are true about our own story and our own lives and stuff like that. And we bring the, the boxes out and we start to put them up. And that's part of the fun for us, at least, of putting you know, decorations on a Christmas tree. There are all these treasures that, that we pull them out and go, oh, I remember about this thing when we got it and what was going on in our life at that time, and they all have significance to it. It's also a time of year when we, we pull out the treasures of the scriptures and pull them out and, and allow ourselves to be reminded once again of what is true about us, of what defines our story of who we are in the person of Christ. And so a lot of the stories that we talk about are, are not like new to us. They're not like, oh, I never heard that before. But we want them to, to be renewed in us as we look at them. So what I'd like to do today is to take us to another one of those familiar stories, kind of an anchor story of this whole thing. And it's found in, the, in Luke, Luke chapter 1. So if you want to find your way there, because you want to see these things, you want to be looking at them as we're going through them. Luke chapter 1. Um, and uh, ultimately, we're going we're gonna to go through quite a bit here and, and get down to what is called Mary's song. Now, before we get there, though, we need to kind of set this up. Uh, and this account that we, we find here that we're going to pick up starting in verse uh, 26, this account here is, is one that you only find in Luke. And the reason is that that Luke kind of is, is, he's different from the other three writers of the Gospels, in that Luke was not an eyewitness to any of this. Luke is a Greek. And Luke is one that, because of a particular task that he has to, to write an account of this person of Jesus for, for Paul's defense, that's, that's another story in itself. But because he's been tasked with this, he is going to collect all the stories. He's interviewing people and, and finding out really what happened here. And so one of those that he seeks out to interview is Mary. And I've had fun in my own mind imagining what this must have been like as, as Luke hunts down where Mary is, now an older woman living in Jerusalem. And I imagine that, that she was pretty well guarded by other believers to protect her. I picture them leading Luke down some little pathway in, in Jerusalem to some ordinary-looking dwelling, and there meeting this person that he has heard about, this mother of Jesus, Mary. And I picture them sitting down. This is just in my own head. Who knows what it looked like, but it, it works in me. But I picture them sitting down in, in her home with, with a candle lit there. And, and Luke looking into her eyes and saying, so Mary, tell me what it was like. And then to, to see this woman, you know, do kind of like what we do when we remember things, kind of to kind of look off a bit and, and say, well, 
It all began this one day. Huh? Can you imagine sitting there and, and hearing her talk about this? It all began this one day, totally unexpected. Oh. And she begins to tell the story. Now that's where we pick up in verse 26. This is Luke recording an account that he heard from her. It says, now in the sixth month, an angel, the angel Gabriel, was sent from God to a city in Galilee, Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph, um, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, <laughs> this sets in motion something that I, I, I think is, is something for us to look at in terms of our own walk with Christ. Because here's, here is Mary. She's, she's a young girl. She's probably, she could be only like maybe 16 years old, maybe 17, maybe 18. But somehow she's a, she's a young girl. And, and at this point, um, she's, she's a uh, uh, woman who is yeah, a young girl who's engaged uh, to be married. Um, I try and picture this kind of thing that, that, you know, a young bride, so to speak, you know, someone who is anticipating this wonderful life ahead of her, um, engaged to Joseph, perhaps the one who's the love of her life, and doing all the kinds of things that, it, that a young girl does as she envisions what life is going to be like, what the wedding will be like, what it will be like to live with Joseph and the little house they'll have out in the suburbs, you know, and white around it and all that kind of stuff. However she pictured it, children running around, oh, it's going to be a wonderful life. Then in the midst of that, God does something that he does to all of us at some point, particularly those of us in this room know this is true, that he intrudes into life as we imagined it and disturbs life as we would want it to be. He shakes it. And when he comes in, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. He says, hail, favored one. Uh, this is kind of a... Uh, a Jewish idiom, so to speak, a, a manner of speaking, um, translated into um, kind of our speak for now. It would be like uh, the angel showing up and saying, hey, you win, when you haven't even entered the contest. It's like, win what? Hail, favored one. It's, in fact, it's the word that he uses here is a word for, for blessed one, one that, that is going to experience Grace and mercy, a great gift is being given to you. And that sounds great until he explains what's going to go on. Because as he describes it here, that, that, that she's going to be one who will conceive a child, not by Joseph. And that she will be the one who will give birth to Messiah. For us, we think, what a wonderful thing. But for her... That rocks her world. This is not life as she imagined it. This is not the way she thought it would work out. Now think for a moment. This is the kind of thing that, that God does with all of us. I mean, we have life kind of how we would like it to work out, kind of how we thought it was going to go. We've envisioned it, kind of the, the best scenario of things. And then when we encounter God in the person of Jesus, when he, when he comes and, and confronts us with, with the good news he intrudes into our life and, and calls us out of life as we have, would have wanted it. Calls us out of that into a completely different storyline. One that is part of his story. And that's what he does here with Mary. Hail, favored one. You win. But it's not going to be the way you thought it would be. I'm not going to simply enhance your life. I'm going to call you out of life as you thought it would be. And into something completely different different. Now, as you read the account here, I'm not going to read all the two, just, we don't have the time to do all of it, but as you read through this account, you find that, that her first response isn't like, wow. Instead, it says that she was troubled. I mean, this, this was news that, that on different levels was very difficult to hear. Great news, but, but it was not what she thought she would hear or perhaps even what she wanted to hear. She was troubled. 
And part of it is she doesn't even understand how will this even happen? God calls us out of our life and everything else and says, I'm going to completely change your life. It's going to be totally different. And perhaps, I mean, if we're thinking, one of the first questions is, how is that going to happen? How are you going to do this thing? And God doesn't give us all the answers. Instead, says this will be a work that I'm going to do. I imagine for Mary, when she first heard this news, the first thing in her mind was, remember, remember those old Southwest ads, want to get away? That first, first thought was, this, this is not good news. Un, something that's completely un, um, ununderstandable, not understandable. But uh, it moves to the next stage of things because the angel tells um, uh, Mary that, okay, here's, here's kind of where your validation is going to come. And he sends her or tells her about Elizabeth. That's another story all in itself. But it says your, your, your relative Elizabeth, who was advanced in years, is now pregnant. In fact, she's six months along. This is going to be the validation for you. Go to her. And that's, that's significant for us to kind of get a hold of because often, you know, initially um, we receive a word from God. You know, this, this is what I'm going to do in your life. Okay, the word from the scripture saying I'm going to change your life. And it's, it's one that... that needs to find its context in the stories of others, others who have encountered the grace of God. And that's where she goes then. She leaves and says that she uh, goes to the hill country where her, her relative is. And the story continues there with Elizabeth. And that same, at least in my translation, that same um, terminology of blessed one comes out of her. Because when Elizabeth sees her, he says, she says, hail blessed one. Uh, but it's a different word here. Instead of it being, here's grace that will be given to you, it's a word that carries the idea of, of grace and mercy and blessing that will be celebrated in you. And that idea of celebrating what God is doing and those around us kind of comes into this thing. Hey, God is going to do this great thing in you. Uh, it validates the message that, that she has received from the angel. Right, she's in this, this time away, this time with Elizabeth. She's there for like three months. And this is a time for her to think through life. She's heard what God is going to do in her life. She's had it validated by, by her relative Elizabeth. But it needs to go from something more than a word that is um, theoretical because there's no ex evidence of it. It needs to go beyond something that is, that is simply uh, experienced through others by being with Elizabeth. It needs to be something that actually becomes her own. It becomes her story. And that's what happens during these three months while she is away. That during this time, she thinks this through. Um, how will this happen? What is God doing? And it's at this point that the story that she has heard from the angel, the truth she has heard, about what God is going to do, becomes her story, and she owns it. The, the way it gets expressed in her is in terms of a, a, um, of a poem or a song. It starts in verse 46 and goes down through 55. This, um, this poem that she writes, this song that she puts together, um, has, has given me a a great um, admiration for this young girl, that she was, she was one who knew the scriptures, able to pull all this together and understand this larger picture of God's redemptive story. And it all comes out in, in this song. It's a great story of God's redemption, a story of, of the salvation that is coming. And she crafts this together. Now, it would be one thing if, if she wrote this during a time when everything was wonderful. Okay, so it would be one thing if, if um, Mary wrote this, prayer, this poem when things were going well in her life, when everything was wonderful, because it, it kind of sounds that way. But instead, what, what makes this such a significant thing in my mind is that, that she wrote this during a time when she thought she had lost Joseph. 
the idea that she was going to have some child that, that Joseph wasn't a part of, I mean, that's, that's a bad setup. That's a bad scenario going on here. And she probably had in her mind, this, this may be the end of that. I may have lost him. She wrote this during a time when she thought perhaps she would actually even lose her own life because the penalty of, of um, uh, having a child uh, becoming pregnant outside of marriage during this time, this, that, was, that was a penalty of death, of stoning. And so this was part of what haunted her, perhaps, in her thinking. She wrote this during a time when Perhaps she was experiencing morning sickness, you know, and just got up and felt horrible in the day. She wrote this during a time when there was very little evidence that anything that the angel had said was actually true. And this comes out of this, this young girl as an act of faith, taking the scriptures that she knows from the Old Testament and bringing them to bear and making this her story. In fact, as you go through it, you, you see personal pronouns used all the way through this, and God has done this in me. This is my story now. Now, as I look into this, this story here, or the, this poem now, uh, which again is, is too long for us to go through in detail, but I found myself breaking it, breaking it into like three parts. Uh, there seems to be three kind of movements to the poem, to the song. Um, and they're captured by certain phrases that are used. Um, and they all have to do with this idea of blessing. The angel announced blessing. Um, Elizabeth confirmed blessing in her life. And now she personalizes this blessing. And if we were to take the first part of this, this poem, just the first couple of verses of it, the, they could be distilled into a statement like this, that blessing comes not from who I am, but from who he is. Blessing comes not from who I am, but from who he is. Look at what it says here. It says that Mary said, or Mary, Mary sang, or however you want to put this thing, in verse 46, um, my soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Uh, this idea of, of exalting is the idea of making something bigger. It's not that, that somehow that she is actually enlarging God, but that she's magnifying the, the, the image of God in her own mind. She's looking more closely at it. She's allowing herself to see more detail in who God is and the, the magnificence of who he is in her own personal life here. Seeing God actually more like he actually really is. My soul magnifies the Lord. Um, and uh, not only that, but she says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. This idea of, of placing her mind on what she finds there and allowing herself to, to get wrapped up in this thing and caught up in this, this the, the wonder of it all. Uh, my, soul, uh, my soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. Notice the personal pronouns in there. It says, for he has had regard for me. He has, he has placed his, his gaze upon me. He has individually looked at me and singled me out for something great that he's going to do in my life. He cares about me. He's taken an interest in me. The first part of the song is the idea that blessing comes not from who I am, but from who he is. But then you move a bit farther into this, and, and the next segment of it here, which would be, perhaps um, uh, verses 49 through 52 uh, could be put this way as, as far as putting an overall understanding of these here. Um, the blessing comes not from what I do, but from what he does. So the first one is blessing comes from not who I am, but from who he is. The second part of this is that blessing comes not from what I do, but from what he does. Notice how she says this here. Here's kind of the the lead line in this thing. Uh, she says, the mighty one, in verse 49, the mighty one has done great things for me. That, that runs contrary to, to often how we think about how this whole thing works because we believe that somehow we must do mighty things for him, that somehow God is impressed by all the great things that we do for him. The longer that I've walked with him, the more... 
my own spiritual life has developed, the more I'm convinced that God is, is unimpressed by the great things that we try and do for him. But instead, he calls us to be those who are the recipients of the great things that he does for us. That God desires to do great things in our lives. And, and that's where the, the wonder of this whole thing come, the, comes. The, the blessing is not from what we do. That God looks and says, oh, you've done such wonderful things for me. I'm going to bless you. But rather, it's, it's this um, receiving side of things, that, that we are the ones who receive from God, that, that um, he does great things for us in here. And then she, she details out some of that here. And then the last part of the song, if we were to take uh, just the last little piece of it here, um, could be put in these terms, verses 53 down through 55. The blessing comes not from my fullness, but from my emptiness. It comes not from my fullness, but from my emptiness. And kind of a key phrase to notice in there, in um, verse 53, it says, He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. It's when we're aware of what we don't have. It's those times when perhaps we, <laughs> we feel broken and, and uh, in need that God blesses us. It's there when we recognize that we have nothing to bring into this thing, that we come as, as beggars before God, that God blesses us. Blessing comes not from our fullness when we're satisfied. It comes from our emptiness, when we long for something, when we hunger for God. And that's how the story unfolds here, our hunger for him. That God, God desires for us to come to him and, and allow him to just pour the wealth of what he has upon us. Um, in the second letter that Peter writes, um, Second Peter, um, the first chapter of that, verses 3 and 4, it talks about the, the wonderful things that God has poured out, the treasures of heaven that he has, has bestowed upon us. Um, those who come seeking what he has for us. He desires for us to, to lavish this. Uh, one of the pictures that came to my mind with this whole thing is uh, something that my father-in-law used to do. Usually it was around this time of year when we have one of those big family gatherings and all the grandkids would come in and, and you know, they're doing all the, 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 the fun running around and, and excitement about Christmas. And one of the things that he would do is he would bring out this big jar of coins that he had collected. Uh, pennies, nickels, dimes, all this kind of big jar of these things. And he'd have each one of the grandkids come up and he'd say, okay, you can have as much of this as you want. Just stick your hand in there and as much as you can grab and pull out, that's all yours. Now for a little kid, this is like gold. You know, that I, oh, wow. And, and so they'd all reach down in there and try and dig their hand in as deep as they can and, and, and pull out this, this huge, what they would say is a huge amount right here. Actually, it's, it would only amount to like, you know, 75 cents. But, uh, but this, this thing of pulling it out and, wow, the treasure that I have. But still, that's what God calls us to do. He says, you can have all of this here, but you come with empty hands. You come hungry, and I will fill you. Part of what Mary did is she processed this whole thing. As she thought through the word that God had spoken into her, as she thought through this whole idea of a blessing in her life, of how God was going to do this, she processed it through and realized that, that when it all settles out, the blessing comes not from who I am, but from who he is. I'm a nobody in this. In fact, she says that. I'm a nobody. The blessing comes not from what I do, but from what he does. God is unimpressed with my actions. And with Mary, there was nothing she did do. The blessing comes um, not for the, the fullness that's inside me, but for the emptiness, as I long for him to fill that emptiness. And she writes this song, puts it together. Um, I wondered what it was, what it would have been like for Luke to sit there and, and hear her talk of this story, 
And I wonder if she got to this point, if, if perhaps she actually sang this song to him. Can you imagine what that must have been like? I wonder if in the, um, the years that came after this, if, if this song was something that, that repeated itself in her life, because it's a song that, that defines her from this point on. I wonder if she sang it during her pregnancy. I wonder, I wonder if she sang it as a lullaby to Jesus. I wonder if she sang it um, after she saw her, her son die on the cross. I wonder if she sang it for Luke. I found this, this is a song that can easily be recrafted for us. In fact, a couple of years ago, I took this song and decided I would memorize this um, as my own song, as part of a, a Christmas gift back to my Lord. Uh, so I'd encourage you as a possibility to look at this, and, and if nothing else, to have it be something that you read through as part of your own meditations going through this time of year. The last thing that, to notice on this is, is verse 56. Because it says, and Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned home. Perhaps the safest thing she could have done would have been to stay with Elizabeth. Have this child away from everybody else. Instead, she does perhaps the bravest thing she could do in life. And that is that she returned home. And allows the story to play out in real time. And ultimately for us, that's where it goes as well. Um, that we must take, <coughs> excuse me, take the story that God has called us into and live it out in real time in the world that, that God has placed us in, in the environment, the, the world as we know it, the kinds of things that are true about your life and mine. And allow God to, to take this blessing and turn it into reality in our lives as we live for him. So my encouragement to you um, is, is to kind of think through Mary's life here, for one thing, that, that she was called out of life as she would know it and into something else, to allow us to share our stories together and find encouragement for this blessing that God has called us into because of his son, but ultimately for us to make his story our story, to personalize this, and, and that during this time of year that that we would find ourselves sinking ourselves deeper and deeper into the reality of what God has done. Let's pray for our Heavenly Father. We pray.